Hello everyone and welcome to this next video in this tutorial series for Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 and the Airbus A320neo. So today we're going to be looking at the final part of our cockpit preparation setup and this is going to involve importing our Simbri flight plan into the flight computer here in the Airbus A320. If you've not yet checked out the tutorial where we created the flight plan in Simbrief, do go and check that out and uh, it'll then give you some extra knowledge that you need to uh, understand better what's going to happen during this uh, tutorial. So if I now bring up our uh, operational flight plan that we have created and we'll hop on board the uh, the aircraft so here we are and I just need to make sure actually <laughs> that I have got the um, mouse cursor turned on so you can see what's happening and what we're clicking there we go all right so this is the final stage then of the cockpit preparation and again we've got a full tutorial for that so go and check that one out before we get to this stage We've now made the Simbri flight plan. What we're going to do is import that into Microsoft Flight Simulator. Now, there's two ways to do that. You can either save your flight plan on the Simbri website and then load it on the flight planning screen in Microsoft Flight Sim 2020. Or you can do as I prefer to do and is much more realistic. Thanks to the Fly by Wire team, you can now automatically import it once you are sat on the ground in the aircraft so basically all you need to do is in the Microsoft flight plan screen just select your gate for your departure don't worry about putting any route information in and spawn here on the ground at the airport so we're on the ground at Gatwick at the moment as our flight plan tells us we should be what we're going to do now is show you how to do uh, how to get the flight plan imported. So if we now click the McDo menu, this is the uh, the screen we're presented with. The first thing we need to do is make sure if we go to options and then AOC and down to Simbrief, you need to make sure your Simbrief username is populated just here. So here's mine, EasyJet Sim Pilot. That's all fine. Once you've keyed that all in and uh, selected it, then that's uh, that's saved for all your future flights. You only need to do that once. So the next thing we need to do then is we can go back to our McDo menu, this page just here, and go to Atsu, then go to the AOC menu, and then it's to the Init Press page at the top. So this is the page which is going to download our Simbrief flight plan into Flight Sim 2020. It will not put it into your flight management guidance system just yet. So once we've selected the init data request, we'll just click that here. And we'll see that this automatically populates with the information to correspond with our flight plan that you can see in the corner. So there's our flight number. There's our departure airport, there's our arrival airport, that's our estimated time en route. Fuel on board, that is the current fuel on board for the aircraft. And we can just look up there and double check that. So there is the current fuel on board. Now that is not the fuel that we will need for this flight. That's actually far too much for this flight as we'll see in a moment. So what we're going to do now is go back to the AOC menu. And we want to load in our weights, balance and performance. So if we select this, we're presented here with our fuel weights. So the block fuel which we spoke about, as you can see on the uh, on the flight plan, is the planned block fuel. That matches up of 7295 with a taxi fuel of 200 kilograms and the trip fuel of 4837. They all match up with what we've got on the uh, on the flight plan so we then click the refuel load button just there scroll over to the next page page two of two and this is our payload and again you can see the payload matches exactly what we've got on our operational flight plan which is shown just there okay so let's now um let's 
check those are correct. We don't need to worry about the forward baggage and the rear baggage. Simbri also tells us that uh, that is 180 passengers. And if you check the zero fuel weight, the zero fuel weight again matches 59.7, and that matches just here 59.7. Rounded down, but that's uh, that's correct. So we can then also press the payload, and that will load this as well. So now that's loaded, just check out the gross weight, which is 66.9 tons. Now check the takeoff weight, which is again displayed just here, showing a takeoff weight of 66.8 tons. So that is essentially 100 kilograms or 85 kilograms of fuel. It is telling us um, that it's going to use to taxi. Now we've planned 200 kilograms for taxi. That's just a standard fuel amount that a lot of airlines use. So that's absolutely fine. Those match up quite nicely. So we are uh, we're happy with that. So that is all loaded in now to the aircraft. The aircraft is loaded with all its passengers and with its fuel. Now we have to actually go and program the flight management guidance computer with the route and tell it what fuel we've got loaded. To do that we start first of all by going to the data page and we want to check the aircraft status. Now this realistically should have the latest air act cycle. That is populated automatically with downloads from Microsoft Flight Simulator. You usually get those once a month. At the time of recording this is actually out of date. I'm recording this on the 3rd of February and you can see that the active navigation database actually expired on the 27th of January. So we're waiting for the next update to come through from uh, from Microsoft. But in the real world, this would be correct. Or if it wasn't correct, we'd call someone to uh, upload the new software. First thing then, we would then go to our init page. Now there are two pages. This is the init A page. This is the init B page, and it's the init A page we want to look at first. This is where we bring in all the information, flight plans, flight numbers, etc., cost index, flight level, into the computer. And to do this, we just simply press the init request page. And you'll see that is now all populated. If we press clear, just to clear the not in database, and clear again, because that that bottom part of the McDo is called the scratch pad and you want to keep that clear before selecting these left side keys and right side keys. Occasionally that will continue to pop up. We can just keep pressing clear. Now you'll see the alternate has not populated. That is correct. As per the real world, you need to pop that in because that can obviously change. Um, so our alternate, as you can see from the flight plan, is Lima. Papa, Papa Tango. Let's pop that in. And then the flight number here, it's actually showing the flight number. Realistically, we want the uh, ATC call sign in there, not the flight number. So the flight number is correct as U21925, but we actually want the call sign. And the reason we want that is because whatever is in this field here is what our transponder will send to air traffic control. And they want to see the call sign, not the flight number. So that's now in there. The cost index of 8 is populated for us. Now let's check out the cruise flight level and temperature. It's telling us we've got a cruise flight level of 370. That is correct. The temperature, however, is slightly different. If you compare that to the flight plan, it's telling us that our cruise temperature is uh, minus 49. So we can go ahead and change that. We just need to type in 370. That's our flight number, followed by minus 49. Okay and that's now updated. The next thing you would do is if you have got Navigraph then you would cross-reference whatever parking stand you are at um, here at Gatwick and Navigraph will give you parking stand coordinates and what you'd need to do then is go into the uh, data just to double check your GPS coordinates were all matching up so that uh, we knew there was nothing wrong with how that was working. You can also cross-reference those with the uh, IRS positions as well, IRS 1, 2 and 3. In the simulator world though, realistically, they're not going to be out. Um, at least, not unless it becomes very, very advanced. So that's just a step that you can or don't have to do. After this then, let's uh, check the flight plan. So if we go to the flight plan page, here is the flight plan that has been imported 
and you can see that uh, we've got London Gatwick in there and the first waypoint Novma. What we have not got is the runway we're departing from or the standard instrument departure. The standard instrument departure is identified just here. Usually the standard instrument departure and the standard arrival, so the SID and the STAR, normally have a six character reference and it has a, uh, a number followed by a, uh, a character in uh, there. So in this case one x-ray and there we've got four kilo. Just so you know that they are not waypoints, they are SIDs and STARS. So we need to put in uh, our departure runway of 26 left and the SID. So to do that we click on Gatwick top left just here tell it we are going to depart it's the only one that is actually uh, clickable at the moment so select the part runway 26 left it also gives you the length of the runway there which is quite handy to know so runway 26 left and then we need to scroll down and find the Novma 1 x-ray Standard instrument departure. There it is. Novma 1 X ray. Sometimes these are shortened just because of the length of the characters that are allowed in these fields. So it's the Novma 1 X ray in this case. So we select that and then we can insert it. If you have to do a transition, then the transition option will come up here. Um, not, uh, it doesn't happen too often, but uh, again, the charts, if you have them, will show you that. Alright, so we can insert that. And now all the waypoints have been populated for that standard instrument departure. We also now need to enter the arrival runway and the star at uh, Faro. So, click on the destination. Let's go to our arrival page. And we will be doing runway 28. Now you've got ILS runway 28 Yankee or ILS runway 28 Zulu. I get asked quite a lot what is the difference between them and the answer is not very much. It may just be that different approach fixes are used um, in the final part of the uh, the route so the initial approach fix might be different or it may be that the missed approach procedure is slightly different. Um, so it all depends which one the aircraft is you uh, which one the airport is using at the time. However, by default, uh, in the real world, ILS Zulu is the one that is normally chosen, and ILS Yankee is there as a backup for, say, if a particular VOR may be unserviceable and not in use, so you can't use it for uh, the go around or the missed uh, missed approach procedure. So we'll select the ILS Zulu, and then we will be coming in via the Alugu 4 Kilo arrival and we've only got one option there and that is via Gipti and we can insert that so now that is all inserted one of the things that we need to check is the distance just here so the distance that we've got in our operational flight plan is 956 and the distance we've got here is 956. That's actually amazed me a little bit because <laughs> that's the first time I think I've seen them being exactly the same to the mile. Normally they can be up to about 10 miles difference, which in the simulator is absolutely fine. Um, if you've got something like 50, 60 miles difference, then there may be something wrong with the, with the database. Um, but that's absolutely bang on, so that's, uh, that's really, really nice. So that's the flight plan done. What we would then look to do, if the ideas are aligned by this point, and I think they are, is we would just check what that coding looks like so to do that we would switch to the plan phase and set it down to 10 miles and then what you can do is you can scroll through and have a look at how this flight route actually looks check that there's nothing silly happening in there particularly in flights in 2020 where some bugs are still lingering around with flight planning it's always a good idea to go and check but if we look at that that all looks to be coded very very nicely there we go and to return to the top of the flight plan you can just simply press the flight plan button there we are put that back to arc mode after you've finished okay so let's come back so that is the flight plan now done 
what we would also do then is we would go to our Rabnav page. Now this gives you the opportunity to pop in any um, VOR frequencies or anything like that that you may need or want to pop in. So I would normally, uh, if it's available, I would normally pop in a VOR close to the um, the airport that we're departing from so in this case obviously it um, it is Gatwick um, so if I just have a quick look uh, we've got Midhurst is actually the closest VOR uh, to us and it is part of the standard uh, instrument departure so I could just pop that in there and once I've done that there's the identifier mid which I get from my Navigraph charts we can pop that in there. We've got an option. There are two available. Um, I'm guessing it's the one. <laughs> they should be organised in distance order, as you can see. Uh, one's 18 miles away. One's 4,400 odd miles away. So it's obviously not that one. So we select the top one, and that's just quite nice to have because then what we can do is we can select VOR one information to be displayed down here in the bottom right hand corner. Now, not all of them give you a, um, a DME, so not all of them have the distance, uh, but most of them do, and it's quite nice to, uh, to have just for if anything goes wrong. It's just another tool you have to work out where you are. And we also need to be at 4,000 feet exactly as we get to the Midhurst VOR. Again, that is shown on our Navigraph charts if you do have them. Okay, so that's the rad nav, and we've set that up with what we uh, what we require at this stage. Now we come to our init B page. So we go back to the it, and then scroll over to init B. This then is our fuel planning uh, page, and what this does is takes all the information that we have, and we pop in here the details from our, uh, our flight plan. So the first thing to note is the zero fuel weight which we have got shown just here. So 59.7, let's get that entered in, 59.7 and then in the simulator we can just put in a default zero fuel weight center of gravity which is 30.0, a perfectly balanced aircraft and we can now pop that in. The next thing we want to pop in is our trip wind, which is found here. So our trip wind for this flight is a headwind of 65 knots. So let's just pop that in here. Um, so H65. There it is. Alright, so what we would do next is then we would press the fuel planning button. And what this does is the aircraft then computes how much fuel it tells us that we are going to require to complete this flight. <coughs> this will not always match your planned block fuel. So if I just scroll down here, so here's the planned block fuel. That is what the operational flight plan is telling us to take. If we now press the uh, fuel planning button, there it is. It is telling us we need to take 7.7 .7 tons of fuel and our plan block fuel is actually 7.2 uh, we round that one down don't round that one up 7.2 is the uh, is the plan block now ordinarily what will happen more often than not the aircraft will suggest it needs less than what you are going to take so if this does happen because we've already loaded our fuel remember you uh, when we imported that from Simreef, if this does happen there's a nice simple fix. At the moment it's telling us we've not got enough fuel on board to make that. So do not go to your weight screen or touch any of this. Leave that as it is. What we would do then is we go back to our McDo menu. Go back to the ATSU, AOC and performance weight and balance. And we would just type in here actually do you know what block fuel instead could we take 7700 zero, zero. 7,700 kilograms of fuel. Pop that in there and reload it. So now that has, uh, that has been reloaded much closer to what we actually would require. Note 
the gross uh, weight of the aircraft has changed so it is now 70 uh, 67.3 which means our takeoff weight is going to be higher um, that again is just something to be aware of we are now only 100 kilograms above our maximum landing weight so again these are just all points to be aware of so that's our maximum landing weight that was our takeoff weight but that has now increased so again things to be aware of however we can now carry on with what we were doing and let's go back to our init B page and we've got a block fuel now of 7.6 uh, that is not yet confirmed because we haven't confirmed that so we're actually going to type in now 7.6 we did ask 7.7 .7, but uh, the APU will be draining some of that at the moment so we can key that in 7.6 now if we just wait one moment that will all start to uh, populate in a minute there we go there are those figures all populating nicely Ordinarily, when you do that uh, fuel plan and press that button, what you will get is uh, the aircraft telling you it actually needs less than the planned block fuel that we were uh, required to take. So if it had told us we, uh, that the aircraft thought it needed, say, 6.9 tonnes, we would still put in 7.2. We'd always go with this planned block here, unless the aircraft is telling us it needs more than the planned block okay so now let's just have a look at what these figures mean that is our taxi fuel 200 kilograms that is the fuel that it's anticipated we're going to use on the trip and the time it is going to take again you can cross-reference those so there's the trip and that the time it's going to take that is our route reserve so we were taking five percent five percent more for the uh, final reserve and then the alternate just check this out so the alternate is telling us that it's going to take 1.1 our simri flight plan actually told us uh, perhaps closer to 1.2 but that is pretty accurate so we can leave that as it is if for some reason that doesn't match up with what you're seeing in the simulator then of course you can change the uh, the alternate and that then here at the final is the amount of fuel you'd expect on board when you reached your alternate. Now, at the moment, these figures are a little bit skew-whiffed and they become even more so during the flight. And that is because the fuel burn of the uh, aircraft at the time of filming this is not quite accurate. It doesn't burn nearly enough fuel that you plan for. So this will perhaps become a little bit more important once the fuel planning is uh, once the fuel burn is modeled a little bit more accurately we can also check then our takeoff weight of 67.2 as we said that is now different to our uh, planned takeoff weight of 66.8 again just something to be aware of and our landing weight of 61.7 that is important landing weight 61 it's actually saying the landing weight there is 61.9 uh, but the aircraft is telling us it's actually going to burn a couple hundred kilograms more during the flight again realistically it probably won't just because the fuel burn is off once we've done that we can just press the fuel prediction page and that tells us we are expected to land at our destination with an estimated fuel on board of 1.9 tons of fuel so that's fine anything below 1.3 uh, we don't like that but above 1.3 we're quite happy all right so that is now the in its B page taken care of and the fuel planning let's now move to the performance page okay so the performance page then is where we basically enter how we are going to take off from runway 26 left first thing we need to pop in is our transition altitude so the transition altitude uh, for Gatwick is and again you would get this either from Vatsim Atis or off the charts if you have uh, a Navigraph subscription um, the transition altitude at Gatwick is 6,000 feet so we can pop that in there let's look at the thrust reduction and acceleration so you know that when you take off 
at the you take off either toga or flex temp and then it will start to flash up here on the primary flight display in this corner just up there it'll uh, start flashing white at you thrust climb that is when you pull the thrust levers back to the climb detent just here what we're looking at doing then is setting the altitude that this takes place at now different airlines have different uh, standard operating procedures for this at easyjet it is for a normal noise abatement departure um, it is 1000 feet so we would be looking at setting our thrust reduction altitude to 1000 feet above the aerodrome level and the aerodrome level here at Gatwick is I'm just trying to find that actually so I'm doing that where is the aerodrome level oh there we go so the run runway is 196 so we could actually type in there 1196 and that for a normal departure usually around Europe for noise abatement is the same altitude as the acceleration altitude so we can pop the exact same in just there so a noise abatement 2 procedure which is the norm is 1000 feet for both the thrust reduction and acceleration altitude above the airfield if you're using a noise abatement procedure 2 which is found I think quite a bit in the USA and some airports around um, some airports around Europe uh, we would actually I've actually got this the wrong way around, so apologies. It's noise abatement 2 that is the standard. Uh, so thrust reduction is 1,000 feet above aerodrome level, and uh, acceleration altitude is the same. And it's noise abatement 1, where we would want to have the acceleration altitude 3,000 feet above the aerodrome level. So if that was the case, it would be 3196 just here. Let's pop that in there, and we're happy with that okay so for all intents and purposes you want to be 1000 feet above the aerodrome level unless it's a noise abatement procedure one in which case it's 1000 feet for the thrust reduction and 3000 feet for acceleration hope that's just cleared that to any confusion there flaps one for the departure which is the normal now the trimmable horizontal stabilizer setting does not need inputting it makes no difference to the planning of the uh, the flight or the uh, computer so most airlines and pilots just leave that blank let's have a look then at our flex takeoff temperature so very very quickly the flex takeoff temperature a lot of you already know that we can trick the engines to taking off with a lower power output and lower thrust which means that it saves engine wear it also is quieter which airports and residents like um, it also uh, uses a little bit less fuel as well on the departure so aircraft if possible airbuses will take off with a flex temp takeoff as opposed to togo which is take off and go around power which is the maximum available uh, so how do we calculate the flex takeoff temperature well let me see if, uh, if I can show you this so if I just open a, another browser page just here there's a great little uh, tool that we can use so if we just type in here a320 flex temp calculator there it is and we go to the first result WAP Pro. so here we are the aircraft is type A320 now it's realistically an A320 Neo but for simulator sakes this works absolutely fine so setting the A320 we are departing from Gatwick we can also pull in the current meta here at Gatwick so there it is our takeoff weight is just here um, actually the takeoff weight has changed hasn't it thanks to that uh, error in our original fuel calculation so if we go back to our init B page so our takeoff weight is 67.2 so we can now pop that in here 67 oops 67.2 
67,200 kilograms. We are using runway 26 left for departure. We are using the full amount of the runway. We are not going to take off from either of these intersections. And once that is all in, the other thing we need to check is it's a flap one configuration. The packs will be off for departure. Um, the anti-ice will be off, I think. Just looking at the current meta, there's no clouds. Ceiling and visibility okay, no clouds to worry about, so anti-ice will be off. Uh, and the runway is dry. Obviously, you need to tailor those. If you've got, uh, if you've got clouds that you're going to be climbing through on departure, anti-ice should be on. Uh, if it's wet, not contaminated, contaminated runway is always a... Um, always a toga departure but if it's a bit wet then obviously you want to change that to wet so click that to dry I've selected the runway already for a noise abatement to departure and we hit calculate and that gives us a flex temp takeoff there of 64 degrees so we can now come back into the flight sim and just type in on our performance page 64 degrees and there it is. Once that is all done then, we can calculate our V speeds. Starting with V2, 139. VR, the rotation, 135. And V1, 134. So at this stage then, that is your flight management guidance system all set up and ready to go. At this point, we would do a departure briefing, which I'm going to talk about in the next tutorial video. Following that, we will look at uh, the departure briefing, as I say, and how we correctly push back and run through, uh, run through the checklists. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much for watching. More tutorials will be coming in this series very shortly. Please do go, do go and check out some of the others that are already there if you haven't done so already. Thank you for watching. Hit the subscribe button. If you have any questions, hit, uh, hit the comments button and uh, leave me a comment there and I'll do my best to get back to you. Hope you found that useful and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye for now.